guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was He. Savior, full atonement, can it be what we so desperately needed, you so lovingly provided? You gave your son, you gave yourself. We are in awe. Thank you.
be seated. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But there was a time when it didn't look so good. I'm going to pick the story up on Sunday. Sunday. What a day. Less than a week ago, Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, hailed by the crowds, Anticipation was in the air, yet Jesus knew this time he'd come to die. Friday, one view. It's been a good day. Trouble's been averted. The plan succeeded. This man, Jesus, is dead. And the Passover crowds, which seemed so likely to erupt in rioting, are not even making a stir. The danger of chaos in the city and of severe Roman punishment 
has been averted. Uh, but there's still a possibility of trouble. This man Jesus said he would rise from the dead after three days. His disciples might try to fake a resurrection. We must ask the Romans for a guard to be placed on the tomb. Just to be sure, no one will be able to steal the body and say he has risen. We must not let anyone stir up the people to revolt against our Roman rulers. Friday, a different view. Death of a vision. Oh, it is a big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster. Do I make myself clear? Jesus is dead. Do you understand? Messiah is dead, killed by our own chief priests. Three years we walked with him, and now our hope and dreams are dead. When someone's caught in a funk, it can be really hard for them to see outside the fog. The disciples who had been with Jesus and heard him say he would rise from the dead lost all hope when he died. The Gospels give us no reason to think they harbored even the slightest thought he would rise again. They'd known Jesus as a man, a great teacher, even heard and accepted his claim to be the Son of Man, Son of God, but they knew him best as a man. And of course, everyone knows, men do not rise from the dead. They'd seen him raise the dead, but he was Jesus and they were not. There was no one to raise him. He was dead, and death is the end of hope. Good Friday or bad Friday? Which was it? Well, it depends on the meaning you put on the events, on how it affects what you're trying to do. It depends on what you believe. Even in the midst of a big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster, God reigns. His laws are unchangeable. His plans are unstoppable. When God makes a promise, it stands firm, as in this one from Genesis 8. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. No man can change nor abolish any of God's laws or promises. No matter how rich or powerful the man may be, he cannot change the law of gravity. It is what it is, and no man can turn it off or damp it down. No man can change the value of pi or make two plus two equal five. No man can change the order of the seasons or put an end to winter. Water flows down. We may carry it up, but leave it alone and it always flows down. A man may find a way to make 350 tons of steel fly through the air rather than fall to the ground. But always it will be by working with the laws of the God of creation not by breaking or ignoring them. God's promises are worthy of trust, even in the darkest night, even in the wilderness with the wild tales of fearsome giants and strongly fortified cities guarding the way to the promised land of milk and honey. The question is, do we know what God has promised? Do we believe the promises? Can he be trusted? The value of the promise depends, of course, on the character of the giver as well as on the belief of the receiver. In order to hold to the promises against all evidence to the contrary, we must get to know this God who makes promises. We must walk with him far enough and long enough to know he's completely trustworthy, even in the midst of the impossibilities we perceive around us. God's promises are trustworthy and his plan unstoppable. So... If Jesus really is the Son of God, come to redeem mankind, see John 3, then why worry? It shall be done, come hell or high water. Day comes, no matter what we do in the night, God's plan will go forward. Day follows night like summer follows winter and always will. Even though the disciples' vision and hope had died, God was true to his promise. Jesus rose right on the schedule just as he had said. 
The question for us is whether we will be able to enjoy the process of getting through the night to enjoy the day. Will we be able to prepare and participate in the plan? Will we be able to walk by faith? Will we proclaim the promise God has given when everything looks impossible? What did Jesus do during this big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster while he was waiting to rise from the dead? It was a big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster, but Jesus was not asleep in the tomb, patiently waiting for Sunday. The cross was just the beginning. There was work to be done. Jesus had promised the thief on the cross beside him that today he would be with him in paradise. So, Jesus must have gone to paradise on Friday. In 1 Peter 3, Peter writes, For Christ, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive by means of the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. In Ephesians 4, Paul writes, Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives. Peter says they were spirits in prison. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Acts 2.31, it says, quoting from the Old Testament, He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, John writes that Jesus said, I am the first and the last and the living one, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Jesus told us the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. In this parable, Jesus portrayed Hades, the place of the dead, as having two parts, a place of torment and a place of comfort. Abraham and Lazarus, and presumably the other righteous dead, such as Moses and the prophets and David and those mentioned in Hebrews 11, were in one part where there was comfort. The rich man was in the other part and was in agony with flames. He portrayed them as having consciousness, the ability to see, hear, feel, and communicate. There was a tremendous gulf fixed between the two parts, such that there could be no flow between them. So, during the time the disciples thought Jesus was dead in the tomb, he was alive in the spirit and traveling in Hades, getting ready for a jailbreak. He was preaching to the prisoners in Hades, and those who had heard and learned from the Father came to him. See John 6. He has the keys of death in Hades. So when he broke the chains of death, he arose, unlocked the doors of Hades, and left, taking the captives with him. Here we see that during this big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster, Jesus was busy with the work of the kingdom of heaven. How will you make it through your big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster? What will you do while you wait for the promised dawn? Will you dance in the rain while the dark storm rages or cower in fear, unable to appreciate, let alone to declare the promised glory to come? How will you prepare for the coming day of glory? What do we need to get through that big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster? We need a big, grand, wonderful, tremendous, awesome promise, a glorious vision of the possibilities. Ideas are powerful and have significant consequences. What we believe affects what we do, who we are, what we will become. If we don't believe something is possible, we won't even try to do it, which is why Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, believing, it's impossible to please God. A strong belief, a strong vision provides guidance and restraint to keep us on the path, Proverbs 29. The death of that vision destroys the coherent focused guidance. There's no clarity of priorities, no guiding light through the mist, only thick darkness and fog without a fog line to keep you from going off the road. When in the midst of trouble, we lose our vision, we are apt to curl up and do nothing. We will miss the opportunity to prepare and or dance by the guiding light of the promise of what is coming when the storm is over. What we see with our eyes and hear with our ears that looks and sounds so terrible is not the scary thing. Rather, it is only the meaning we put on those perceptions that are scary. If we reframe the perceptions and see them in a different light, they may very well become exciting, not scary. When we believe the promises of God and not our own thinking, 
we are walking by faith. Those things are no longer scary because God's promises make us aware that they can be overcome. Of course, we must have developed a strong confidence in the promises. Apparently, the disciples had a touch of selective listening disorder in that they did not really hear Jesus when he told them about being killed by the religious leaders and rising from the dead. Today we have the benefits of hindsight, and it's a wonderful thing. Living today, we have a tremendous advantage over the disciples who were in the garden with Jesus. We might think they ought to have known, but perhaps it was not that easy. If we had been there, we might well have done the same, or worse. Yet there's one thing they could have known. Jesus had clearly told them on various occasions what was going to happen. In Matthew 20, we read, And as Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve aside by themselves. And on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will deliver him up to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify, and on the third day he will be raised up. In Mark 8 we read, Peter answered and said to him, Thou art the Christ. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He was starting, stating the matter plainly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. In John 2, 19, we read that Jesus said to the Jews who asked for a sign, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The disciples were not the only ones who heard this. The religious leaders knew he had said it, and he would rise on the third day, and they requested that a Roman guard be placed on the tomb. Jesus plainly said to his disciples that he would rise from the dead, but it was hidden from them. That is, it was something they did not see. Perhaps they did not see because they heard only the death part, and refusing to accept the death part, they did not even hear the glorious second part about the resurrection. Death of Messiah did not fit their understanding, nor their desire. He was also their friend and teacher, a wonderful mentor. It was unthinkable that he would die. Peter even tried to rebuke Jesus for saying this. So obviously Peter had heard and understood the first part. But Jesus told Peter that he was not understanding because his thinking was wrong. Peter heard it from man's point of view, rather than realizing that God's promises and plans were at work. And because they refused to accept the death, the disciples completely missed the second part. They missed the wonder and the awe the exceedingly amazing glory and implications of the resurrection that was to happen on the third day. Watch out. Our understanding of God's word, his teaching, his communication to us, his message, can be skewed by our own wants, wishes, hopes, and plans. We must be careful. Jeremiah 17 warns us, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? To be his disciples and avoid this selective listening disorder... We must deny ourselves, our thinking, and our plans, and follow him. As one Haitian translation puts it, we must forget our own head and follow him. We need to perceive our situation the way he sees it, with eyes of faith in the character and the promises of our God. This is not something we learn to do in an instant. It takes ongoing practice to, in order to internalize it as a habit of seeing things from God's perspective. It takes coming to know him, and that comes from being led by the Spirit over time. Resistance is to be expected. A big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster is not what you would normally expect when you decide to try to do God's will. But if you choose to do the righteousness of God, you will certainly be resisted by those who have a different goal, whose tutoring father is the devil, the deceiver. In some cases, that might really hurt, as in being stoned, sawn in two, tempted, put to death with the sword, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. Matthew 5 tells us, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Jesus walked the talk. He set the example, walking as the Spirit led and doing whatever was necessary even to the point of death. He was confident that God is able and willing to raise the dead. How much more will he take care of those who are faithful to him? Our obligation to our brothers. 1 John 3, 16. By this we have come to know the love, because that one placed his life over us, and we are obligated to place our lives over the brothers. As Abraham was willing to offer his only son with similar faith, we can offer our only life, if that is what it takes to get the job done. Jim Elliot said, He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So how in the midst of a dead vision, a horrible, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster, are we to renew the vision and be transformed into faith-filled, exuberant disciples of Jesus? We're told, walk by faith, not by sight. Learn to dance in the rain. Don't wait until the thunder ceases, the storm clouds dissipate, and the sun breaks through the clouds. While waiting, do maintenance and prepare for the next step. But how do we do this? To know that Jesus died for us and to be grateful for his death on our behalf is very good. But if knowing is as far as it goes, we are in danger of developing a dead religious spirit. His example needs to be internalized into action. We need to just do it. We need to get it into our heart where it will become the guiding light. We need to get God's perspective to hear what he says without distortion of our own ideas. Consider this. One. Hear what he says and memorize it so you can, too, keep it in mind. Meditate on it, that is, eat it, internalize it, digest it, so that you can, three, do it. It is a lifestyle. It takes practice. It is an ongoing walk of faith. This learning to listen and walk, led by his tutoring spirit, but we must do it, for it is in the doing that we mature and become more like him, holy as he is holy, a witness to the world. Therefore, when you encounter a big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster, remember the promises. Believe the promises. Act accordingly. Even the darkest night heralds the coming of a new day. As bad as Good Friday appeared at the time, it was a necessary part of God's great redemptive work. In the midst of your big, bad, horrible, miserable, terrible, really bad, crushing disaster, remember, God sent His Son... And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living, just because he lives. Amen. And Lord bless you. Thank you, Paul. Well, if you, uh, you know, I don't think I would have been too far off of those disciples. It would have been a horrible time. I wouldn't have seen it myself. I don't know if any of you would have or not, but I would have been right there. It would have looked like the end. So if you reflect with that, on that with me for a minute, just Friday, Jesus goes to the upper room with his disciples. They celebrate what's called the Passover. It's a, it's a Hebrew feast and it's during that Passover is there 12 of them there and Jesus that Jesus takes a piece of bread and he breaks it and he he changes it up a little bit and he says eat this and when you do remember me he knows what's coming right they don't know but he knows and then he takes the cup when you drink this remember me the blood of my covenant We can go back there, in a sense, with them and remember that time. We have the advantage of knowing what came, don't we? So we do it in a celebratory way, unlike the disciples who grieved greatly, deeply first. Up here are three tables with communion set out on them. And I just want to encourage you to, we're just going to take a few few minutes and Bring your family unit or the people you're sitting next to, just a small group, and come on up at your leisure and take communion together. I encourage you, somebody in the group, to take the lead and 
dad, grandpa, if you're in the group, take the lead and, and speak. Don't just pass them around and be silent, but remind yourself of why we do this. It's to remember him who gave everything that we could have life. And we look toward Sunday, but we need to remember the depth of what happened Friday. So please take your time, come on up and have communion together. Unlike the disciples on that Good Friday, we know the whole story. We know, we, as we look at the cross, we know about the empty tomb and about Christ our hope. Stand and sing with us about that hope.
dismissed.